If you were to listen to the lyrics of a rapper named Woody from Northern California, you might notice frequent references to the year 1994. What exactly happened in 1994? Almost 30 years later, a shroud of mystery surrounds this year, so we decided to look into it. We hope that this video will finally provide some answers. Here's everything we uncovered. So we might as well start at the present. And that's easy, because for Gabriel Snoop Roberson, the present has more or less stayed the same for the last 28 years. Since March 19th, 1995, when he was just 17 years old, Gabe Roberson has spent every single day of his life inside the cell of a California jail or prison. Gabe was convicted of a murder that happened decades ago, during a time in California where gang violence was responsible for thousands of murders every year, and seized the attention of not just state leaders, but the national media and the White House. By contrast, nowadays, virtually all of the deadly violence of the 1990s is long forgotten and many of the people who went to prison for murder or manslaughter around that time have been released from prison too. Neither of those are true in Gabe's case. He's stuck in a cell with no chance at parole for years, and in all likelihood will remain behind bars for decades to come. But at the same time, Gabe's case is far from forgotten. And if you go to Antioch, California, and talk to folks, you'll find that many strongly believe Gabe has lost his entire adulthood over a crime he never committed. In this video, we'll attempt to explain the history behind his case, the gang beefs behind the deadly shooting that ruined a girl's coming of age party, and how the voice of just one man was able to keep the case of Gabriel Snoop Roberson from being forgotten. Let's go back to the early 1990s in East Contra Costa County, a place we've covered before in another video. Nowadays, the area's biggest city of Antioch is known as a haven for drugs, crime, gang violence, and a notorious kidnapping by a child molester. But back in the 1990s, Antioch sat at the crossroads between being a farm town and a quiet bedroom community, and was little more than a blip on the radar to folks who lived outside of the immediate area. Its neighboring city of Pittsburgh, however, had a different reputation back then. Pittsburgh was a high crime area, and a place known for shootings, robberies, gang brawls, prostitution, open-air drug dealing, and practically every other crime you can think of. And while Bloods and Crips violence grabbed the nation's attention in the Los Angeles area, in Northern California there's a different kind of color war going on. Norteños and the Sureños, translated simply to Northerners and Southerners, who claimed red and blue respectively, and carved out territory through cliques that formed organically throughout the Bay Area, Central Valley, and coastal communities. During the 1990s, a few such subsets rose to prominence around the same time. They were largely made up of kids who were just a few years past puberty, yet their lifestyles and the crimes they committed were well, well beyond what you'd expect from a group of kids. The prominent Sureño gang in Pittsburgh at that time was Los Monkeys Trece, or LMT, whose territory centered around West Boulevard. Teens' parents who were from Los Angeles or who had traveled from that area were more likely to join LMT. But if you were an up-and-coming Norteño, you probably ended up in either the Pittsburgh-based East Bay Locos or the Antioch gang known as the West 20th Street Norteños, a name bestowed upon them by a local newspaper, also called West Twomp for short. Members of these two groups were known to intermingle, and the violence between both Norteño cliques and the LMT became almost routine. That brings us to April 16, 1994, when a 16-year-old Pittsburgh resident named George Garcia decided to take advantage of his father going a couple hours south to San Jose and invite friends over to his home on 138B Madeline Street. He asked about a half dozen people to come over, but one of them, a guy named Goofy Eddie Segura, who drove a distinctive 1979 Burgundy Monte Carlo, 
circulated a flyer advertising the party around two local high schools, so a lot more guests were bound to show up. Among them were brothers Carlos Blackbird Ramirez and his brother Ray, as well as Gabe Roberson and a host of other EBL and West 20th Street gang members. For you see, George Garcia was a Norteño and was hosting a party with many Norteño guests, despite living right in the heart of Sureño territory. They soon learned that they weren't the only ones who knew about the party that night. A little before 10 p.m., a blue sedan drove by, and someone hung a gun out the window and opened fire at the house party, striking Ray Ramirez in the side. He fell, hitting his head on the concrete, while the bullet instantly paralyzed him from the waist down. His 17-year-old brother, Blackbird, witnessed the entire thing and was obviously incredibly distressed. Five years later, after lingering in poor health, Ray Ramirez would pass away shortly after being admitted into a local hospital. Gabe Roberson was standing right next to Ray Ramirez when he was shot, but didn't stick around too long after the cops got there. He would later explain that he'd decided he'd had enough for one night and simply walked on home while replaying the traumatic events of the evening in his head while other Norteños from the party plotted retaliation. This incident set off a chain of events that would forever change the lives of everyone involved. It just so happened that on the same evening as the party on Madeline Street, a family was hosting a coming-of-age party for 15-year-old Christina Ramirez at the Veterans Hall in the neighboring town of Antioch. Known as a quinceañera, the celebration was set to go well into the night, fully catered with food, beer, and music. Quinceañeras are typically joyful events, full of life and dancing, where the young lady who's being celebrated gets to help plan her own party in great detail. In this case, Christina made a seemingly innocuous decision that might have factored into the tragedy that was about to unfold that night. She decided that guests would wear sky blue and that the room should be adorned with white and blue balloons. Simultaneously, Christina's father hired a band but gave the musicians specific instructions. They were absolutely not allowed to invite anyone else to the party, despite that being a somewhat common practice for hired bands. Unfortunately, the band ignored this request from the Ramirez family, and at least one member invited some buddies to enjoy the fun, including an LMT Sureño named Cristobal Lozano. Two years later, Lozano would be arrested along with four other Sureños on suspicion of killing 18-year-old Luis Cano in Antioch. And he'd later take a plea deal for an assault with a firearm charge. But on this night, police were pretty certain that he'd had nothing to do with the shooting at the party that paralyzed Ray Ramirez. And the two suspects who police eventually identified, Joel Pirate Tapia and Baltimore Arroyo, were never charged with shooting Ray. But they were known LMT Sureños who were both implicated in other unrelated acts of gang violence. At any rate, the quinceañera was coming to an end a little before 1 a.m. on the morning of the 17th, when party guests noticed a subtle disruption. A young man, whom no one invited, opened the door to the veterans hall and peeked inside appearing to carefully inspect each table of attendees. He appeared to fixate on Cristobal Lozano. Then he closed the door and left. Multiple attendees would later identify this person as Goofy Eddie Segura, who had arrived in his Monte Carlo with a carload full of Norteños. Around the same time, one of Cristina's friends came up to her and told her, there's a bunch of Norteños outside Christina replied that someone should tell an adult. But before long, two more young men burst into the veterans' hall, one armed with a revolver, the other with a sawed-off shotgun. They appeared to be aiming at Lozano, who was standing near the band, when they opened fire. Lozano escaped injury completely, but five people were hit, including two of Christina's uncles and three other party guests. Alfredo Gutierrez, an uninvited guest whose brother was in the band, was one of the men to be hit by a bullet. He would later recount, quote, I just couldn't breathe when I got hit. It felt like someone hit me with a bat on my ribs. 
A couple feet away from Alfredo, 26-year-old Jorge Franco fell to the ground and keeled over, quickly bleeding to death from a gunshot wound that struck him directly in the heart. In the span of a few moments, this coming-of-age party had been turned into a gangland bloodbath, and almost none of the party guests saw the shooters as anything more than a couple of shadowy figures who left as quickly as they'd arrived. Despite the plethora of witnesses, the possible connection between the earlier shooting in Pittsburgh and the fact that Goofy Eddie had been positively identified just moments before the actual shooting, no arrests were made in the case for years and youth violence in East Contra Costa County continued. Two months after Franco was killed, an underage East Bay Locos member named Gabriel Olage was arrested for stabbing a 17-year-old Hayward boy at the Sun Valley Mall in Concord, California, after they both yelled out their names of their respective rival gangs. Olage was sentenced to a stint in the notorious California Youth Authority, and released shortly before his 21st birthday. But just two months after his release, Olage was shot in the neck and killed in Pittsburgh. The suspected shooter, 18-year-old Alfonso Calderon, was identified as a fellow Norteño who Olage allegedly mistook for a rival and confronted with a knife. The shooting was ruled self-defense. In August 1994, George Garcia would become implicated in a homicide in Antioch, alongside another teen named Victor Ayala. According to police, media reports, and Garcia's own statement, Ayala fatally shot 18-year-old Philip Adrian Nolan while Garcia fired off a sawed-off shotgun. Ayala was charged with murder, while Garcia was hit with attempted murder charges. But their cases were handled in juvenile court, where penalties are much lower and the proceedings stay out of the public's eye. Nolan's death was preceded by the killing of a 14-year-old Richard Oriana in nearby Concord just two weeks earlier, which was also chalked up to the norteño Sereno conflict. The following month, at a bonfire market in downtown Antioch, three people were shot by a young man who first fired at a person he was arguing with but then appeared to just shoot randomly into nearby crowds. Luckily, no one was killed. One evening in January 1995, at a Taco Bell in Antioch alongside Highway 4, someone in a yellow Malibu full of Norteños fired several shots into a BMW after one of the passengers yelled something at them. One person was struck in the hip and another cut by broken glass, but nobody was killed. This time, the suspect was identified as an Antioch native named Ryan Wood, whose red-tinted hair may have made him easy for eyewitnesses to identify. Wood was spotted by the police shortly after the shooting, but escaped following a car and foot chase. Wood's residence in nearby Clayton was raided by police, and they seized photographs and other evidence before ultimately arresting him on attempted murder charges. Wood was able to avoid prison, thanks in part to a lack of witness cooperation, but was required to stay away from the Antioch area as a term of probation. In just a few years, though, Ryan Wood would be known around the world for being influenced by his upbringing in the city of Antioch, and the Taco Bell shooting would later be immortalized in a popular song. In November 1995, yet another teenager was killed in a shooting this time just one block away from Antioch City Hall. 17-year-old Martin Maya was shot in the head, abdomen, and arm, but survived until the next day when he was pronounced dead at a local hospital. Two others were injured. This time, police identified a suspect within hours of the shooting, and detectives would later claim that the same man was responsible for the Bonfair Market shooting nearly a year earlier. It was Carlos Blackbird Ramirez, Ray Ramirez's brother, who had apparently spun out of control after that fateful night on April 16th the year before, after watching his brother suffer. Layman, the night before April, he got shot, started a big old thing, a whole bunch of stuff happened. Brother got shot and just went crazy. 
That was the beginning of his downfall, Blackbird's probation officer would later tell a local newspaper. Before that, he wasn't a serious criminal, just a gangbanger having fun. A judge issued a warrant for Blackbird's arrest. The only problem was, around this time, Blackbird seemingly vanished. Not Antioch police or other local agencies, nor even the U.S. Marshals could find him, and they theorized that he had fled to Mexico. While the search for Blackbird continued, police were trying like crazy to gather enough evidence to justify charging him with the murder of Jorge Franco at the Veterans Hall. But so far, they were striking out. They were certain that Blackbird was the man wielding a sawed-off shotgun, but as the manhunt showed no signs of ending, Detective Leonard Orman of the Antioch Police Department concentrated his efforts on identifying the second gunman. And by February 1996, Orman was pretty sure that it was Gabe Snoop Roberson, who had fired the revolver at other party guests. Orman traveled down to meet Snoop at Susanville Prison, where he had been serving a sentence for home burglary and robbery charges. Snoop had been behind bars since the year before, when he was still just 17, but now, as a very young adult, had been transferred to the California prison system. Their conversation went like this. Orman spoke with Snoop casually about Ray Ramirez being paralyzed, but then his tone changed. He started grilling Gabe about the quinceañera, telling him he'd never see his two-year-old son outside of prison ever again, and that if he admitted guilt, he'd be dealt with more leniently. Gabe offered denial after denial, then completely broke down, effectively ending the conversation. Orman returned back to Antioch without a confession, but nine months later, the Contra Costa District Attorney decided he didn't need one. Gabe was charged with one count of murder for Jorge Franco and four counts of attempted murder for the party guests who were in the line of fire. There was a shooting. I was never questioned. Almost two years went by. I was in prison for something else. It's the only time I'd ever been locked up in my life. And um, they came and questioned me. I just told them I didn't know. I didn't know. I knew I didn't do it, but I didn't know who did it. And they told me if I didn't want to cooperate, they had me placed in the hole, so I got placed in the hole. The whole uh, administrative segregation is what they call it. They lock you in the cell, you stay in your cell by yourself all day. Basically, it's uh, isolate you. My parole date, the detective came back and told me I was being charged. The case was strung together thusly. One party guest had identified Gabe from a photo lineup and repeated the ID during the preliminary hearing, while a second man had told police he saw Gabe outside the veterans hall with a gun near Guffietti's Monte Carlo, then later claimed he wasn't so sure. It was that and a whole pile of gang evidence, detailing not just Gabe's ties to the West 20th Street Nortenos, but other crimes committed by other gang members, including some like George Garcia who turned away from the gang after the Philip Nolan homicide and was now a government cooperator. Ironically, prosecutors theorized that Franco's killers had gotten the guns from Garcia's co-defendant, Victor Ayala, who loaned them to other Nortenos while he was in jail for killing Philip Nolan. One thing jurors were not allowed to see was the conversation between Detective Orman and Gabe, as Judge Wayne Westover explained the offers of leniency in an attempt to elicit a confession had gone too far. Quote, I think the officer just went one step beyond with what he's done here. I've heard his interviews before and upheld them, but I think this one is different. Gabe was brought back to the Contra Costa County Jail and his trial started in early 1997. As expected, Prosecutor McGregor Scott brought forth both gang members and several party guests as witnesses. One, a former Norteño named Miguel Fregoso, who'd claimed that he'd seen Gabe outside the Veterans Hall, now waffled. Quote, I don't remember. I don't know. It kind of looked like him, but I'm not sure. Only one person positively identified Gabe as the shooter in court. He was Alfredo Ramirez, a 46-year-old Salinas resident who had been shot in the chest and was both Cristina and Jorge's uncle. Ramirez did not waver in his identification, other than insisting that he did not feel the effects of the beer he drank that night because he was dancing, 
but towards the end of the trial, a seemingly insignificant detail came out. As the trial was ending, Detective Orman testified that Alfredo Ramirez had initially offered a description of the shooter with one very specific detail that could not have applied to Gabe. He had distinctive blondish red or reddish blonde hair. Nevertheless, Alfredo had identified Gabe in both a photo lineup and in court. So when jurors began to deliberate, they were heavily leaning towards guilt. But days into deliberation, there was still one holdout who didn't have faith that Alfredo was sober enough to identify the shooter. A mistrial was declared, and McGregor Scott was taken off the case and replaced by another deputy district attorney, John Cope. At Gabe's second trial five months later, his luck ran out. He was convicted of murder, all of the attempted murders, gang charges, and enhancements for use of a gun, leaving him with a sentence of life and then some. Still gotta be deceased and come back five times before he's released. At age 18, swiped off the streets and set up by these punk bullies convicted of fucking. Quote, I'm glad he got it because that's what he deserves. Oscar Franco, Jorge's brother, told reporters. Gabe was returned to prison, and when the door slammed shut behind him, there was no reason to think that his case would ever get widely spoken of or paid attention to again. It had received minimal media coverage with reporters in the area much more intrigued by the manhunt for Blackbird. But the following year, that changed drastically. In early 1998, Ryan Wood, the West 20th Street Norteño who'd been involved in the Antioch Taco Bell shooting, kicked off his career as a rapper, and from then on was forever known by his stage name, Woody. Woody took interest in breakdancing and hip-hop at an early age and started rapping in high school. Despite some significant hurdles, he was white in an era where Vanilla Ice had made a mockery of white rappers. He was self-funded. His hometown lacked major street credibility at that time. He produced his own beats and he lacked mainstream acceptance or distribution, his debut album, Yak Influenced, began generating a buzz. Woody started selling the album out of his own trunk in the spirit of a Bay Area rap entrepreneurial spirit that became widespread in the early 2000s, but eventually started stocking the shelves of local record shops. In the blink of an eye, Yak Influence was being sold out of Tower Records, Sam Goody, and other major chains. Woody's songs were transparently authentic, the musings of a young man caught up in a treacherous world of gang violence, torn between unwavering loyalty to his friends while contemplating how and when he'll face the consequences of his lifestyle. He spoke not just about gang violence, but the dilemma of being caught between the streets in his own family, and also spoke about real life events with piercing accuracy. These are real events that happen. I'm talking about real people, homeboys of mine. Um, this isn't a fictional tape. This is this is real things. This is my side of it. You know, this is how I. On the album "Demons in My Sleep," released through the major distributor Koch Records, Woody included a song called "Tales of a Killer," with a verse that recounted the events of the Taco Bell shooting that mirrors the police reports in that case almost exactly. There's another common theme in Woody's music. Gabriel Snoop Roberson. In song lyrics, album liner notes, and in interviews with the media, Woody insisted that Snoop was innocent and praised him for his, quote, loyalty. Woody also had a message for Snoop. Quote, we got that appeal lawyer coming, bro. As Woody's fan base grew and the phenomenon of anonymous internet forums began to spread in the early 2000s, fans across the United States grew curious about this person, Snoop, that they kept hearing about in songs. The local newspaper even took notice and aired an interview where Woody gave his side to not just Snoop's case, but several other high-profile incidents in East Contra Costa County. The cops and the DA might have won in court, but Woody was winning on public relations. 
However, this had no bearing on Snoop's case. He lost his appeal and continued to serve out his life sentence with no other legal options available. As Woody's rap career was just taking off, yet another tragedy occurred in July of 1998. After a manhunt that lasted four years, Blackbird surfaced in Antioch, but he would never end up in police custody. He allegedly showed up at the home of his ex-girlfriend, took their two kids, and barricaded himself inside the house for what turned out to be a multi-day standoff. In the end, both Blackbird and his daughters were dead from gunshot wounds. Police announced that Blackbird had killed the girls and then turned the It was the second such standoff in Antioch to end this way within a relatively short period of time. But friends and family members of Blackbird have rejected this version of events, with Woody insisting that Blackbird and his children were killed by police, pointing to the fact that he had suffered two fatal gunshot wounds to the head as evidence of this. Perhaps to push back against this narrative, Antioch police released tapes of the standoff. While those tapes were released to the media, no versions have surfaced online, and the Antioch Police Department says they have since been destroyed. All that's left are online articles where journalists recounted what they heard. Woody was devastated by the death of Blackbird. They trying to lock all of us up. They might have killed the babies and low. They knew that Snoop didn't kill nobody and said this him to the most. No, got them. Pick a start as Blackbird tonight. I'm chopping it up with my big homie. He might be gone, but he's still in my life. If the food is up, the writers will want us the same spirit. His flesh is gone, but his soul is on. And when he speaks to me, I hear it. The only thing. You know, if you gave out, I'm one for that. I'll be with you right now. As the years ticked on, Woody's rap career continued forward, and his fan base got bigger and bigger. He got a major record deal from Koch Records, but also continued putting albums out on his own label, East Coco Records, and became known as a local legend. He continued to rap about Snoop's loyalty, and how he was wrongfully convicted, with lyrics that seemed to hint at the identity of the real perpetrator. Just as love, I can't appreciate enough the days like this I live to see. If it wasn't for a homie like Snoop, Snoop would be me. And all the black were right here to share it. Him, but didn't have a clue that I would soon be gunning for revenge. For my enemies to paralyze and slowly sell the fate of my blood, brother. Wait, what the Bible got to say? If my family's hurt in any way, somebody's got to pay for it. Homies who right, police say forever suits. Lock down, he's innocent. You can ask the yacht. Devour, strip that OG from his reputation in the late night hour show. Shower, let the situation sell with fun. But ain't no stopping the popping that gets to dropping these pumps. I found my Around 2002, Woody moved to Paradise, California, a small town in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, where he started meeting new people. Shortly thereafter, Woody's music started to take on a darker tone. Lyrics about gangbanging and partying were overshadowed by lyrics about government conspiracies, mental health, and otherwise morose themes. But then, on March 7th, 2007, Woody died of an apparent inflicted gunshot. As rap fans mourned the death of an underground legend, Woody's mother made an alarming post on an East Coco Records internet forum, stating that after Woody died, he had been robbed by a, quote, evil girl. To this day, circumstances surrounding Woody's death remain somewhat of a mystery. Online rumors spread that Woody died in a town called Florence in Oregon. This rumor traces back to an online post by someone named Sharon M. We were able to verify that Sharon M. is in fact related to Woody and resides in Florence, Oregon. We will leave it at that. Another rumor is that Woody was distraught following the death of his wife but we could not find any confirmation that Woody was even married. We were also unable to locate a coroner's report, but did find confirmation of death from the Social Security Death Index. Nevertheless, not even Woody's close friends know exactly what happened to him. Damn. Still can't believe my skin is young Can't shake the feeling in my gut There's something more that went on But you the only one that knows the truth Which adds to the stress So many questions still unanswered I can't seem to let rest It's weighing here But here's what we do know About the days leading up to Woody's death An IRS tax lien was levied against him In late 2006 For $10,282 He made frequent trips to Oregon and Washington 
He used several burner phone numbers and even used a fake name to obtain a P.O. box in Paradise, California. In June 2009, Lenny Cervantes, who was a close friend of Woody, died in a mysterious car accident in Paradise. Nearly 30 years have passed since the fateful night of the Veterans Hall shooting, and a lot has changed. The men who prosecuted Snoop went on to become a leading U.S. attorney and a judge, respectively, while his lawyer was also appointed to the bench. Detective Orman remains in law enforcement after an esteemed career at the Antioch Police Department, and Woody's music is as popular as it ever was, with many of his friends dedicating their own rap careers to keeping his legacy alive. For Snoop, though, almost nothing has changed. The Innocence Project considered representing him, but ultimately turned it down because it generally reserves resources for cases with DNA evidence. His appeals have struck out, and his first parole board hearing went horribly. And unless he shows up at the next hearing with his hat in hand, ready to confess to something he still insists he did not do, it's unlikely to go any better. Barring a long-shot pardon from the governor, the only hope for Gabe Roberson would involve a review by the Contra Costa District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Unit, which, ironically, is reviewing thousands of convictions due to a massive scandal involving alleged corruption, criminal activity, and racism within the Antioch Police Department. But while none of the involved officers were around when Snoop, Woody, and Blackbird were roaming the streets of Antioch, many in the local community see it as vindication to their claims of rampant, ongoing corruption within the police department. There has been but one major recent development to all of this. But once again, it came from the rap world, not the court system. In mid-2022, a Pittsburgh rapper named Awax, who was the longtime friend of Woody, put out a song called East Coco, a clear tribute to Woody's record label of the same name. In it, AWAX claimed first-hand knowledge of a confession tape that Woody allegedly recorded shortly before his death, where, quote, everything that Snoop is in jail for, he, as in Woody, admitted to. That tape, if it ever surfaces, could be a get-out-of-prison card for Gabe combined with a witness statement that indicated that a man with distinctive blonde reddish hair was holding the revolver. But like so many subjects of intrigue in this tragic tale, the evidence of its existence is limited to the lyrics of a classic Bay Area hip hop record. So far. Yeah, and I love all my family, all my homies. You know, I never turn my back on any of y'all. How could I look what Snoop did? Loyalty above all laws. 